Hello and welcome to this tutorial on OSPF. This is the second tutorial of three where we cover all of the concepts and theory behind OSPF. In this one we're going to talk about the link state database and also how routes are created by using the Dijkstra algorithm. Now in part one we talked about how OSPF forms neighbors by using the hello messages. And then when, we, when they get to a certain point in their, their process of becoming neighbors, they have to decide whether or not they will become fully adjacent or not. And we mentioned that depends on how the network type between them is defined. We mentioned point-to-point -point and broadcast. There are also other uh, network types as well. There's the non-broadcast and the point-to-multipoint, and each of those has different characteristics as well. For now, don't get too worried about memorizing all of the different network types. Just keep in mind that there are implications based on what type is used. So now let's go ahead and continue that conversation. Let's take a look at what happens when two routers, whether they are in a point-to-point -point configuration like we have here, routers A and B, or if they're on a broadcast network and router A is talking to a designated router. What happens when they de decide to pursue full adjacency? In other words, what happens after they reach the two-way state of becoming neighbors? Now, after successfully reaching the two-way state, both of these routers, A and B, are going to begin the process of exchanging their link state databases. And so first what happens is, these two routers determine who is in charge. So someone has to be in control of this process in order to guide the process along. Okay, so one of these two routers kind of takes charge and the two routers will negotiate this and this, this is actually a, a state of the neighbor process and it's called the exchange start state. It usually is just written as EX start. So this is kind of a, a formality. Let's kind of figure out the rules of how we're going to proceed. Once they do this, then the routers enter the exchange state, and this is where they actually start exchanging the link state advertisements. So in the exchange state, the first thing that happens is each router is going to send a database description to the other router. And this is just a list of all of the LSAs that are known to each router. Now keep in mind, it's not the actual link state database and all of that information that there that is inside there. It's just a summary, just a list, a description of what they have. Then each router is going to inspect the other router's database description. Take a look at the list and see what they have. As they do that, each router is only going to request the LSAs from the other router that it doesn't already have. So if router B is inspecting the database description it received from router A, it will only ask router A to send the LSAs of a route that it doesn't already know about. So you can see here OSPF is, is pretty efficient in this process. They only exchange what is needed. And this process go, is going to continue between the two routers until they have the exact same information in their link state databases. Now at this point, both of the routers move from the exchange state into the full state. And this is the final neighbor state. At this point they would be considered fully adjacent, they are full neighbors, and they have directly shared link state database information between each other and their databases are synchronized. And that would end the actual neighbor process. Okay? If you're on a router, and we cover the details of this in the configuration tutorials, but you can see a list of neighbors and the states that they're in by issuing the show IP OSPF neighbor command. So what is life like for two routers that are fully adjacent to each other? Well, what they do is they will continue to exchange hello messages. And this acts as a keep alive in order to make sure that the neighbor is still there and functioning. Do you remember we talked about the dead interval timer and how that would state how long a router would wait to hear an OSPF hello message before declaring the neighbor is down? Well, that's used here as well. And so they keep track of each other in that, in that sense. The routers are also going to periodically send link state advertisements to each other. 
This happens every 30 minutes, and the purpose is to refresh the advertisements uh, on the other router. So router B, after 30 minutes, will receive a link state advertisement from router A that it already has in its link state database. And this is to, to let router B know that that route is still good. Now these are spread apart 30 minutes, but they all don't happen at once. They're actually staggered. So the expiration time on each LSA occurs at a different time. So in reality, these, these updates are happening all the time because different routes expire at different times. Okay, however, if there is a problem on the network, a router will immediately send an LSA and that will be to alert the network of a change in the topology of the network. So even though they, they abide by this 30 minute refresh rule, if something bad happens on the network, they react immediately. Okay, so that's kind of how routers function in the fully adjacent state. They constantly keep in touch with hello messages. They constantly refresh each other's databases by, by sending LSAs. And if they need to, they react immediately and send out new LSAs should a problem happen. So now that we've covered the entire neighbor process and the exchanging of link state databases, we have one more bit to cover, and that is, what do we do with this information in the link state database? Because it's just information about the network. It's topological information. We have information on each router, information about all of the connected links to each router, and all of the different subnets that are on the network. And everyone has the same bit of information. However, this is just information. These are not actual routes. We need to do something that, with this data in order to create routes for our route table. And this is where the Dijkstra algorithm comes into play. Dijkstra's algorithm is the shortest path first algorithm. Dijkstra, by the way, was a Dutch scientist, and luckily for us, we don't have to understand how the algorithm works. We just have to know what it does for us. And so quite simply, the function of this algorithm is the same as the name itself. So by using this, we discover the shortest path, possible path to a destination. And so when we apply this algorithm to our link state database, we find out the shortest path to any destination on the network. And basically, the algorithm creates a topology. It uses this information to uh, connect everything together. And then it's going to go ahead and for each destination, determine the shortest possible path by adding up the associated link costs uh, to get there. So we can take a look at this example here. If router A wanted to reach router D, it's quite simple. It has two choices. If it goes through router C, it incurs a cost of 10 on the first link and then a cost of 10 again on the second link the total cost to this destination going through router C would be 20. So it's important to keep in mind the cost is cumulative. It's for the entire path to the destination. If router A decides to route through router B, it has a cost of 1 plus 100 for a total of 101. Now just as a reminder, these costs are based on the bandwidth of the links. So the lower the cost, the faster or the more bandwidth there is for that link. So quite simply here, the cost of 20 is a lot less than the cost of 101. So router A would choose the route that goes through router C in order to reach router D. And so this is the process that uh, the Dijkstra algorithm would go through in order to create our routes for us. And every single router is going to do this on their own link state database. So each router determines its own best routes to a destination. And then once it does this, it places these routes into the routing table. Now when a change on the network occurs, this whole process is going to be repeated. So let's say the link between router C and D fails. Both of those routers are going to send out updated LSAs because something on the network has changed. The topology has changed. Router A is going to receive that updated LSA and it will first go ahead and update its link state database. After that, router A is going to reapply the Dijkstra algorithm to the new information in the database in hopes of determining a new route 
to the destination. If it had multiple ones, it would still look for the lowest cost. In our example, there's only one other choice, so router A would determine that the route via router B is the best one to get to the destination of router D. And then it would go ahead and put that route into the route table. Okay, so this is how OSPF reacts to changes on the network. Okay, let's summarize what we covered. We now know the path to becoming fully adjacent requires exchanging the information in the link state databases. And we touched upon two intermediate states that routers will go through, the exchange start and then the actual exchange state itself. In the exchange state, first we start off by sending just a description of our database, and then each router is going to go ahead and request only the information it needs in order to update its link state database. After this process is done and both routers have the same link state database, they are considered to be fully adjacent. They are in the full neighbor state. Now, once they have all this information, they have to create routes from it. And that's where the Dijkstra route algorithm comes into play. And we talked a little bit about how the Dijkstra algorithm is going to look at the cumulative path cost for each option to get to a destination, and it'll choose the one with the lowest possible cost. Okay, so that is OSPF part two, the link state database and the Dijkstra algorithm. Be sure to check out part three of the OSPF tutorials where we talk about designing OSPF. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for watching.